All right, so this is the build OGM call on Tuesday, December 28th, 2021, the last such call of this year, which is strange. Um, and um, I, I would love to explore a bit. Uh, Stacy, uh, we were talking yesterday and she put a, a thought that, that uh, marries up nicely with a thought I've been having about, uh, and then hers was motivated partly by looking at me struggling to get four episodes of the weaving the world up and do all, you know, do the back processing. And I've been completely hijacked by a move. Uh, we're in, this is, this is new digs. This is, uh, uh, there's just stuff on the ground. We were expecting actually our first house guest last night, uh, a teenage friend of friends who had to pass through town, but his flight got canceled. So he didn't make it. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, kind of the office space in our, uh, our new digs. And uh, I'm now, we now have a stable household and can kind of walk around and function. We have nice, fast Wi-Fi. All those kinds of things are, are, are working. Um, and partly also, uh, and this, this has to do with the conversation with Sam, um, there's just a lot of moving parts here that if we find the right combination of parts and people are eager to jump in and start to, to play with us in, in a good way, like good things could take off. And so uh, I think one of the feeder conversations to this is the term composting and me calling this the secondary calls, composting calls, which just wasn't working. Um, and then me borrowing from mapping parties, which is what open street maps does to think of maybe like they're weaving parties. And if we can have like weaving parties uh, where people come together with tools and do stuff uh, and then think of these as teams that are on a, a scavenger hunt to solve clues or aspects of whatever topic it is we're looking at and, and you know, organize up somehow like that. I don't know, uh, Stacy. if you wanna riff on that, uh, welcome to hear it. Uh, but the idea is, can we play with format and structure some to make this, I don't know, to not, to not be limited and to, to sort of uh, uh, lift what we're doing in a different direction, not in the same direction, but in a different mode, I guess. Does that make any sense, Pete? Uh, kind of, yeah. I think you want to hear from Stacy first, right? Stacy's Stacy's liking where the conversation is, but not jumping in. So I'll just, you know, I'll just throw in the ideas where I said to Jerry, I sort of like saw, saw a space in between a school and a community center where there, where like OGM is creating a space where somebody doing a podcast like Jerry's doing right now, he's the prototype for it, could come into that space. And there are different people that are working on similar things. They go, they have the technology, but they go where their interest is based on the conversation. But then it sort of overlaps because we're a social community. So there's, you know, the conversational part of it, but then there's the written part of it. I see us, we're like the conversational place. I mean, people come to these calls, they want to be here. And I think we should capitalize on that. Um, but I did suggest to Jerry that maybe we take some of the production money and at least get one person who's not just doing the um, production work, but teaching others to do it. Because there may be people that want to want, want to learn how to do that work, so it's almost like an internship program. And of course, you know, we may there may be things that I don't like about the internship programs, and you don't like. But if we used it correctly, and it wasn't just using people, it was actually giving something back with an opportunity to maybe do more. I think that could be a good thing, and it could lift the weight off of one person in particular. And also give an opportunity for other, you know, if somebody in OG, you know, maybe maybe Klaus wants to do one session, there'd be people here to help him. And through that, I, I just think, you know, it would get synergies going, but at least. And partly Stacey was noticing that like Gil was saying, gosh, I could really use help with, you know, production sort of things. I mean, I don't think he said those words specifically, but. He did in a like post. He actually okay. did in the post. Good, yeah. So, so, so like Klaus and Gil and others, uh, if if there were if there was a crowd of of uh, people who started learning how to use the tools and were helpful, that could work. The, um, so it's kind of a crowdsourcing video production slice of our activities. I think that you're you're describing. Um, 
one of the problems with, with it is that it's really hard to be complete and to do good work when you're doing piecemeal, like, like small pieces of volunteers who are at different levels of training, because you don't know what somebody finished and what's, where somebody picked up and what, what, what got done, what isn't, what isn't done, et cetera. It's, it's hard, to, hard to manage that. But I like, I like the vision a lot. And that's why I recommend having at least one person who's paid to do it because it's their ultimate responsibility to make sure it all gets done. Right. Uh, which then becomes kind of a, a semi-staff person. Yeah. Um, the, the crowd stuff sounds like a, a phase tooth kind of thing. It, it sounds like a complication, not a uh, simplification. Because it means managing a bunch of people to still get the same work done. Well, sort of. that and it, it means finding a bunch of people and motivating them and, you know. Well, it's also new people, I think, because Stacy, I'm not sure how many of the people who show up regularly for any of the OGM calls yeah. would be up for that task. So really, these are, these are new folks. New people. Yeah, that we don't have in the in the in the conversation at this point. Um, so that's so kind of finding finding people is a big deal. Yeah, you see, and and I don't again with the opportunity that I'm thinking about. I think I think just on Facebook I could find people that are really smart that come from those different sectors that we keep talking about. We want to bring people in. I think I could at least I, at least a few. I think I'd be able to get. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the problem we're trying to solve again? Um, go ahead, Stacey. Well, to be honest, the problem I'm trying to solve is that Jerry doesn't have to sit doing something he really doesn't want to be doing. <laughs> That's how I, I mean, I want you to be able to do the stuff you really want to do, the parts of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and using the script to do the editing is actually reasonably enjoyable. And I've done transcription before. It's just incredibly time consuming. Um, and also there's a piece of having participated in the conversation and understanding the topic that's really important to a good transcript, uh, cause there's a bunch of stuff that that's in it. That's kind of coded. That's easy to misunderstand, you know, in the case of Jesse's call about NFTs in the market and proper nouns that just get, you know, that the translator has no idea about that, that the script, uh, the engine doesn't know about. So, so somebody with some pretty good domain knowledge kind of needs to be in the loop, um, um, so I don't know. So I, I, I think partly I've picked up a, I picked up a project that requires that kind of work that I just need to sit down and find time to do. And then, and then once I've gotten through the, the four calls, um, I think then it's like, like stand up, look around. And I think Pete, you've been sort of saying, let's just do this manually for a while to see what, what actually requires automation. Yeah. And, and automation also meaning outsourcing or crowdsourcing or whatever. It may also be that paying a professional uh, transcription service two bucks a minute uh, to do this out of the budget might be a fine way to go. And, and it, you know, feeding a transcription service the proper nouns that happen in this episode that we noticed before the episode probably turns out a pretty good transcript. I would do that uh, if, if the trans transcription time is a problem. I would um, just pay for a prof professional transcription, either the Descript White Glove or Rev.com. And and you're right, I think feeding them a vocabulary would help a lot. Yeah. You're going to hear these words. So let me ask a different question. Well, two things. First of all, I was struck by the fact that you said you kind of enjoy it because other people might enjoy that too. But so if we're, if we're gonna pay, I, I'm wondering if there's a way to negotiate with Descript to get that free service be, and then we will highlight, you know, we'll be providing, you know, we'll be, I mean, it's sort of like when you wear a company's t-shirt, you know, it's like you're advertising for them. So, I mean, it wouldn't cost them anything and they could be getting exposure. Maybe we should look to work out some kind of agreements like that with okay. software like Descript. Yeah, it's a possibility, but our, our audience would have to consist of more than dozens of people uh, coming in because there, there's no value at this point to our audience. Uh, if we had a huge audience, if we were, you know, Joe Rogan probably gets things thrown at him to, to go use on the show. Um, and that takes somebody to go negotiate and, and say, hey, would you like to do this and so forth? So 
I like it. Um, but you know, we can also I can also find out whether Jim Rutt or someone else would like to you know continue funding because this would eat money and we could do it that way. Um, oh, I had a different thought. Oh, I wanted to go back to the other thought that you were having, Stacy, which was um, school meets uh, sort of sort of civic center or activity center or something like that, <clears throat> because I think that's a that's a different you're trying to solve a, a specific problem, which is sitting in the middle of us, which can be solved in the ways we've been talking about right here. But there's, a, there's another wrapper problem, which is like, what is the dynamic we want to have in the group? And it might be that interns or volunteers or other people aren't actually coming in doing the editing of episodes, although that's I like that a lot, but they're doing something else and they're doing productive work in the weaving and they're learning to weave. Like, like if we taught weaving, in the sense we mean weaving here, weaving slash composting slash mapping slash whatever we call it. If, if they could apprentice into a group, to a community doing that, that's unique. There, there, there are not a lot of places and people doing those kinds of things. Uh, you just muted yourself by accident. Oh, you're taking a call. Um, Otherwise, how's stuff? <laughs> stuff is good. I think I would get some more assets built before trying to trying to off road. Well, it, it's funny. There's it's it's there's a lot of trying trying to simplify things, but it's simplifying by complicating rather than just you know. Right. The the presenting problem is not difficult, and and uh, spending spending cash to get you know one transcript done um will either work and then it's just cash it's not a lot of cash in the grand right. scheme of things or it won't work and then and then there's a, a, another problem to solve but so it occurs to me that so the four calls i have two of those are actually ogm calls the metaverse and metaverse calls it occurs to me what i should do is submit the daryl davis call for professional transcription and just try that yeah. out Right, because I'm working on Jesse. I'll finish Jesse. I'll get through it. Um, the other two are multi-party calls with like, lots of complicated sort of back and forth and cutting off and so forth. I will take a swing at those. But the easiest of all these to get professionally done is Daryl, and that'll give us like how much did it cost, how long did it take, how good was the quality. That'll that'll burp right out of that one. Yep. So I think I think maybe we try Descript White Glove um, and see what that does because yep. I've got a Descript account and I can I can you know I can submit it. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Sorry about the part I missed. Just going back to before I got that call. Um, yeah. Is, you were talking about bringing the interns in and I was um, on the OGM email list. Somebody mentioned about lurkers. Did you, I don't know if you read that. Yeah. yeah. So as a lurker, <laughs> Um, my feeling is that sometimes putting people in a space, not really defined why they're there, they wind up realizing why they're there and moving yeah. towards. So I, I'm more about just bringing people in proximity. I agree. So I'm a big fan of lurkers, partly because long ago <clears throat> in an early paper, uh, Etienne Wenger and Jean Laves wrote about legitimate peripheral participation, which is like a terrible acronym, but a really good descriptor, which says that lurkers are at the periphery of conversations. They're just kind of listening. And every now and then they jump into the middle and take a turn because, because they heard something that was like, oh, I know about this. I can help with this. That's whatever. And, and part of the job of a host or facilitator or creator of an online space like that is to th put enough sort of juicy things and to goose the conversation and take it in different directions so that people actually find the things that they want to jump into, right? Uh, so so I, that's kind of how I run things. And I'm trying, you know, part of the reason I'm exploring issues by saying, well, what about this? What about that? Part of it is that I'm just a, a pattern finder and I like to do that. But part of it is at some point we're going to hit a couple of things where a, 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 a small group will split up and say, hey, that's interesting enough. And we seem to share a passion about this, that we'd like to go do that and, and flesh it out and bring it back and say, here, we, we did this sort of thing. And that's happening a bit in different ways. Um, 
So, so love them lurkers. <laughs> Pete, you're having a thought? Just looking up uh, legitimate peripheral participation and the book thereof. Yeah. Oh, good. I didn't, I have the, of course I have the term in my brain, but I didn't know it had a Wikipedia page now. So, and the thought, oh, wow. <clears throat> okay. So the term legitimate peripheral participation, I put in my brain, January 13, 1998, which means it was within the first month of using the brain. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Um, and, um, I think they also in the, in the book talk about boundary documents. Is that the right, is that the same, same work? I think, uh, I don't know. Might be, that might also come from, uh, John C. Lee Brown and do good and social life of information, but I'm not sure. Boundary so, document. Hmm? Is that really? Boundary? So boundary documents are like, um, in, uh, and now we have a lot of them because we have Miro boards and, and Google Docs and all that kind of stuff. But back in the day, you know, you'd have a trading desk that would pass the book to the, to the night shift that would be located in Asia that would pick up all the trades and the, the open balances. That, that trading book would be the boundary document. So it had to be written in, in a way that was understandable to different groups of people using the same information for some important task. That's maybe too, that's maybe too restrictive a, a definition of it. But boundary documents are things that, that operate across groups uh, as holders of content, meaning whatever, memory. <clears throat> and so that's another, another really interesting term. Like a summary <clears throat> of what was done during what? the day? Sort of, well, more like a working document, like, a, like, an, like an important thing that we're using to get our work done together. And Pete, do you know that Jean Lave's ex-husband was my professor, my favorite professor at Irvine? No. Yeah. So Charlie Lave uh, was an econometrics professor, and that's how I that's how I did econometrics in school. <clears throat> and you'd walk into his office, and it was it was a like a disaster zone. There was stuff piled everywhere, and he had a really gruff demeanor to people he didn't know, which was a really excellent defensive tactic <laughs> to avoid having his time wasted. And then once you got to know him, he was an absolute pussycat. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, early mentor. So um, boundary document reminds me of boundary object. Uh huh. It also reminds me of uh, my netcom days when the boundary document was uh, a mud that the customer service reps used for persistent. Um, it's like the uh, the ship's log. Mm -hmm. And boundary object itself has a uh, Wikipedia page and comes out of Susan Lee Starr. Um, cool. Uh, <clears throat> Pardon? And Griesmer. Ah, cool. I don't have Griesmer. Let's see. Can I share something unrelated to what you're saying? But of course. <laughs> I Before I got on this call, I posted something. And I said, hey, friends, if you could help me to confirm something I've been thinking about, I'd appreciate it. Can you just post yes, no, or unsure as a response to, do you understand what the meta crisis is? Thanks in advance. I've already gotten a lot of answers. It's only been a few minutes, but what do you think most people say? Good question. Um, I would say yes. Well, the, the answer is no, which is what I expected. And the reason I asked that question is, so I sent you the um, podcast with Daniel Schmachtenberger that I listened to this morning. And the first question, you know, the first thing he starts talking about is this meta crisis? And I was like, people don't know what that even means. And I just wanted to verify. So except for like Brian, who said, yes, that's how I met you. <laughs> the other people like unsure, I don't know, no. And these are every, basically most of the people that answer are really smart people. <laughs> Interesting. Meta, meta crisis is a generic term though. So the meta crisis is kind of an odd, they don't know either. They, 
I don't think they know what either one means. And my point is that I, and this is something I keep trying to bring is we're asking like, first we have to get on the same page of what we're even asking for. You know, it, it, when we're all in like the same community and we're used to the same language, then we kind of know what things mean. But for somebody brand new coming into a different bubble, things that we take for granted are not really as obvious as we think. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Which, who are, you, who are you asking? <laughs> I'm not, I'm just saying, having had to live through just observing for so long and trying to figure out. I mean, even with Sam yesterday, I had to, and I know him really, you know, we know each other pretty well. And I was like, tell me though, what is it specifically that you want to accomplish? And I heard the answer for the first time in, in after years of knowing him discussing this. And to him, he thought it was obvious. Can you share what it was? No, I'll let him share when we have a okay. call. <laughs> cool. That's great. So I'm reminded in an odd way of, um, of a movie, Don't Look Up, which <laughs> Joanne and I watched yesterday. Oh, good. You like which, um, I, it's It's uh, incredibly clever uh, satire, um, clever, extremely well done. And, and so it's enjoyable to watch the satire and the, you know, the jerk directorial choices and the the actors doing their parts and it's very unsettling to watch the whole thing because it's a satire of our state of the world um our with our, our previous president and then also with the um the dissociation of between facts and and beliefs and it's like it's it kind of disturbing <laughs> um it's so it's odd having something that's kind of it's, it should have been enjoyable but it was mostly you know at the end of it is like my stomach kind of hurts and we had a good conversation about it yesterday on the free jury's brain call where a piece of what a piece of the conversation was what the hell is going to convince people to take action on climate change etc cetera, etc cetera, on the meta crisis right yeah. and, and 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 it was like is it satire like that is that going to make people uncomfortable enough or will they even make the leap and get the connections Right. Well, they just see it as a as a flaky disaster movie. You saw it too, right, Jerry? I've not watched it yet. It's on my on my in my queue. Yeah, totally want to watch it. You'll enjoy watching it, Jerry, and you'll also be very uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 how it feels. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, and I said this on the call yesterday, and now it's been confirmed. A big segment, and I'm watching on Facebook, believes that this is about climate. That the movie was about climate change as I believe it was. Mm -hmm. But as I suspected, another big portion of the people watching the movie think it's about politics and the media. I mean, of course, it's about all those things, but it's, it's really interesting. So when I hear somebody say, is this gonna bring awareness? You know, What's gonna wake people up to climate change? To some people watching it, that's not even what the movie was focused on. And some people think that Meryl Streep is playing a Hillary Clinton character. Well, yeah, I shared that with you because yeah. somebody had commented they were annoyed that it made Republicans look bad. And I was like, why do you think they were Republican? There's a picture of her with Hillary, with uh, Bill Clinton. And when I was talking to my more libertarian type of friend, he said, oh, well, we know that's Hillary. So it's just really funny. <laughs> Um, I, I read her as a combination of Trump and Palin and not Hillary at all. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It all depends on, that's the point. Yeah. Can she see Russia from her backyard? <laughs> she sees interest. She sees and doesn't see interesting things. Cool. I look forward to gritting my teeth and seeing it. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, intelligently delivered satire is, is really good. Worth its you have gold. to stay until after the credits because if you're somebody that closes after the credits, you miss the last scene. Good. Thanks. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Good to know. Um, so we've got a couple calls set up, other sorts of things. I've got to sit down and do some some work on 
uh, finishing Jesse and, and plowing through. I will I will go figure out how to submit uh, Daryl through White Glove. So I'll get that started. Uh, that makes good sense. And um, what else should we talk about in this Build OGM Spirit call? Does the poll you want to create fit in in any way? Yes, absolutely. Um, so in a conversation last week, um, a thought came up that I should construct a poll to send anybody and everybody who's seen my brain, watched me use the brain or whatever, just to try to figure out. And I don't know exactly what questions I should, I should start a draft of what questions to put in the poll. So it's not too long, but so it gets actually to some of the issues, but, um, is it useful? Is it useful with me, without me? Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting right now what other questions I wanted to ask, but just like to get a, a state of, of what's up, because I have no idea whether, you know, given a hundred people who've ever, who've ever witnessed me using it, uh, is it, is it five who are like, wow, this is awesome. Or is it 30? And if it's five, that's a really different sort of state of the world for me than if it's 30. Right. And if it's 60, that's an awesome state of the world. Um, so I need to figure out what the diagnostic questions are to do that. But Stacey, thanks for bringing that back into attention. Cause I think, I think I've never run that. I've been using the damn thing for a quarter century now, like next December is, is an actual quarter century, uh, which is a real long time for a human to do something, um, and, and not know much about it. And, and the brain has never given me any kind of stats on usage. I have no idea if it's eight people coming in or 8,000, none. Uh, they couldn't connect, you know, Google Analytics to it because I would love to have a Google Google Anal Analytics page looking at, at you know, patterns and, and what's up. Oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'd love to instrument uh, the software with, but isn't there? Um, Pete, do any questions arise for you? Um, I I think the first first you might want a crisper understanding of what you're trying to find out. Yeah. Um, so partly I'm trying to find out where's the pony, like, where's the use, is it useful and how and where and why and in, in what sense and what do, what do people think it does? I'm probably wandering a little field already and I'm only two sentences in, um, So I have a, one of my amateur theories about perception and memory and mapping and all that kind of stuff is that different tools work really well for different people and that there's some set of categories that I don't know that anybody's gone out and, and tested or studied, but some people like calendars, some people like lists, some people like uh, outlines and just work entirely in outlines. I happen to like the brain, other people like other, other kinds of, of tools that just work for the way our minds work. And... I don't know if those are mutually exclusive and not very compatible, or if they're just different manifestations of a similar kind of thing that, that show up differently in different places. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy in, in many of these cases to squish things down. The brain has an outline view, for example, that I never, ever, ever use. Um, it's not pretty, uh, but, but it's squishable. Um, or, or what? So I think, I think a piece of this is a broader poll that I don't want to undertake which is which of these different things appeal to you. And, and you know, I would love to find some visual uh, designer who's, who's run a study that says of all the different categories of tools, here's how we classify them and here's how people seem to fall out. That would be great. Um, I've never even done a Google search on that. Um, but that's a higher level question that, I'm, that I mean to ask here specifically about my use of the brain. Go ahead, Pete. I was gonna say, I, I've kind of wondered similar things um, and I think a lot of the the tools that we have are constrained enough and um, removed enough from from what you really want that I think there's kind of a path dependent way that you end up with a tool that you're comfortable with um, because none of the tools are very very usable um, uh, so you know, somebody, somebody got to understand outlines really well, or got to understand wikis really well, or got mm -hmm. to understand the brain really well. 
um, partly because you know the underlying schema makes sense, partly because the uh, the UI and the UX is is comforting or right. you know familiar, or if they know somebody else used it or whatever. So you have to sit with the tool long enough to kind of get it to stick, and then. And, and, once, once you're, and once you're invested in it, in the sense of you've put a lot of data into it, if it's not easily exported, not, you know, if it doesn't move to anything else easily, you're kind of hooked just through inertia, just because yeah. you've got assets in there, right? Yeah. And they're hard to get out. Yeah. Um, it, and, you, and there's the, <clears throat> even on top of that, um, even if the data is exportable, um, you know, if you're hooked on outliners, it's really hard to pick up a wiki. And if it's if you're hooked on wikis, it's really hard to pick up an outliner, even if you've got the data. There's another phenomenon on social media for groups, which is that lots and lots of groups have medium high functioning conversations in really old tools, mm -hmm. because it's really hard to leave a tool as a group much easier as a human. Like if, if there's like one mass exporter, if you have to just cut over and do something, you know, a, a person will switch tools and over, I mean, I can point to the long period of time when I was at New Science, when everything was in HyperCard. I had my address book, my calendar, <clears throat> my, my, you know, my to-do list, all those things were, were in HyperCard stacks and I could program in Hyper, what's it called? HyperTalk, thank you. I could program lightly in HyperTalk and make things happen. And it was really like, you know, if they had added URLs to HyperCard, the HyperCard could have been the web, uh, but they had idiots at the, at the control panel. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and then I can point to a period where I was using Echo, then I can point to, you know, switching over to something else. And, and I, I have errors of different tool use until I hit the brain and it eats a whole bunch of things, but it doesn't eat my contact list. It doesn't eat my email. It doesn't eat a bunch of other things that I still do. Um, anyway, trying to try, Pete, trying to scope in where the pony is is like a, a way of describing it. Where's the value and to whom? Who sees the value? Who gets it? Uh, and maybe even what do they think could be done with it, or or something like that. Just a, I think ending with an open-ended question <clears throat> that says, you know, if if this if this poll is making sense to you so far, what's the best possible thing that could happen to to this? It would be an interesting question to end with. You could probably walk through a discussion of of that those kinds of topics with a few people like me or Mark Antoine or or Stacy or um, and and probably get a lot of information and that might help you um, make a better. I, so I I think you know the the top line thing for me is I I would guess that. Well, the top line thing for me is distribution, what I, I call distribution, Silicon Valley distribution, just uh, awareness and, and knowledge of of the brain at all. So my guess is very few people have ever seen it and very few people have, you know, gone, seen more than one page of it. You'd be surprised how many humans I've run into who said, oh, yeah, 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 I tried that once long ago. <clears throat> and they're like, they're like familiar. The, but it the brain get. or? <clears throat> the, brain, brain. the brain specifically. No, not mine. Oh yeah, but, I, I, but a lot of people yeah. are familiar with the tool. Yeah, a lot of people are familiar with the tool. I think very few people are familiar with your your brain. Yeah, that's kind of that's limited to my my wanderings. I think, and and I have no idea um, how much reach it's had beyond anybody I've contacted. Meaning, I'm getting no stats. I have no I have no way of figuring out who downloaded my app in the app store and used it and was happier. Who who accessed the web server website and was happy. So I'm no no clue. Um, the the easy fix. Well, I don't think uh, I think I don't think Google reaches into the into your brain, and the, the fix for it is to help Google reach into your brain. Well, which is one of the reasons for OGM, which is externalizing my brain. Then means it's Google searchable, and then we're off off to the races. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you should just uh, export it to. You should just site brain the whole thing. All right. Well, I, I can also kind of, I, I think what the pony is, I, I think there's two ponies. One of them is not particularly useful. Uh, it's just the, the, the interconnection of topics. Um, so most people don't really use graph, like a graph 
um, most people don't use a graph to do anything with. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the graph is a little bit useful probably to, um, to other graph databases, uh, like whoever owns a graph database, OpenPsych, or sorry, not OpenPsych, closed psych. <laughs> and um, you know, the, the Google Plex, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not in acquisition mode, so they don't really care. Except right. that if you made it, you know, if you made it spiderable by, by search engines, Google and Bing and whoever else. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that was uh, Laura, Laura, Laura Ann's suggestion was to use it as feedstock for somebody else's knowledge system uh and find him somebody who's doing that like deep mind or somebody else but I haven't yeah the, the the weird thing is they've probably got most of the connections already um and they're not in the habit of, of absorbing um because there aren't that many things to absorb <clears throat> yeah and they clearly would have a better mapping of congress critters actors in movies authors of books all that stuff that's that's you know obvious and canonical out there they should yeah. have hoovered up already yeah. through IMDb or Goodreads or whatnot, <clears throat> uh, where what they wouldn't have is a, any sort of opinion threads or narrative threads uh, that I've woven in, which are more dependent on me. So, so then I think that's the real pony. The real pony is the animation that you can give to the graph. So, and that's, you know, we, we don't get much of that. Um, Oh, wow. Somebody's on our roof pushing snow off the roof. I can hear their footsteps and I can see snow falling outside the window. Wow. <clears throat> Since we're on the seventh, the seventh floor is the top floor now. I'm like, wait, what's that noise? And it's like, somebody's walking over my head. <laughs> I, I think it's Santa and reindeer. <laughs> I did not hear jingling, however. It's my theory. <clears throat> nor do I see a glowing red light. Well, it's, it's after Christmas, so they have to be kind of stalled. That's true. They're kind of off duty. <clears throat> we have a, so one of the symbols of Portland is the white stag uh, neon light that's right on the Willamette, <clears throat> not an old mill. And at, in, in winter time around Christmas time, they put a, a red, a red, a bright red nose on it. So it's really pretty cute. <clears throat> and I think white stag was a brand, I think of flower, but I'm not sure. I've got it in my brain. Did I miss the second part? This thing, okay. Two ponies, interconnection. With, did you was that both ponies or was that two ways to describe it's, it's one? Both. There's a there's a graph mm. and then there's the stories that Jerry has embedded in the brain that aren't actually part of the brain database. Um, they're part of uh, YouTube videos or you know, pick my brain or whatever, but they're not. Um, so it was hunting gear, outdoor gear, hunting gear, sportswear. White stag Hirsch Weiss was, the, uh, and it was started by Harold Hirsch. Hirsch means stag in German, and so here's the um, white stag sign, <clears throat> which previously was a white satin sugar sign before it was a stag. A little bit of Portland trivia. So Weiss is also white. Yeah. So we don't know any game show producers in OGM, <laughs> like people from television. Yeah, who do we have that might like to do game show kind of thing? I think if we were to say, hey, let's let's prototype a game show, I think five people would poke up and say, I'll try, but I don't think any of them would have experience doing that. Why a game show? Because that's what I see Jerry's brain perfect for. <laughs> And I think it could be more than just entertainment. I, I see it as a, to me, that's crowdsourced learning. Yeah. And partly the, the conversation that Stacey's provoking, which is like, what are different formats for doing this is really interesting to me because I think that a, a piece of what we're, what we're near, but haven't really stepped in is what would be a different and useful and fun way of doing this work together and, and, and of, you know, digesting the elephant, <clears throat> right? Uh, but doing it in a really fun way. And it smells like scavenger hunt. It smells like quiz show or trivia show. It smells like uh, debate with uh, pogo sticks. It smells like uh, <laughs> wipeout, right? Remember the show, the Japanese show Wipeout? 
<laughs> Stacy, did you ever watch it? It was this weird ass obstacle course that they would send contestants, contestants, God love them, would run out across these obstacle courses and get just like whacked by paddles, padded paddle strikers, whatever's. And, you know, one of them would be like a big cross that's spinning like this and you have to jump over them, except you don't, there's really sort of no place to jump. And then you fall into like a mud pit or a water pit below. That, 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 that's how the contestants end. Um, and it was just like really funny, <laughs> funny to watch. And then there was an American version of it. I, I'm pretty yeah, sure it started in Japan. Staying away from the funny to watch stuff. Yeah. To, to me that, you know, that's- Especially when somebody else is in pain as they like fall into the mud pit. Yeah. Um, so maybe Wipeout was a bridge too far. <laughs> yes. Um, but just trying to think more broadly about what the format is. Because right now, part of the reason to stand up a podcast is that it is a known format and it is the thing that people can go, oh, okay, there's a podcast, but there's something else going on behind the curtain. I'd like to find out what that thing is. And it turns out that the party behind the curtain, maybe the weaving party at this point, is actually really fun. And, and you know, people joined Open Global, oh, sorry, people joined Open Street Map partly because they, somebody had been involved in mapping parties and said, hey, come with. And then suddenly they were on the road in their town, driving around and they were coming back, learning something about uploading to a database. It was all, it was all functional fun uh, that delivered a collective asset, a huge collective asset, right? Which Google did by forcing the function and hiring drivers and doing it in a systematic way because they had the budget and like thought big. Who thought that you could map all the streets on earth just about? Like, who had that thought? Amazon. Yeah. Well, Amazon all just needs to instrument the trucks, right? Because they're already um, they, on the street. They started uh, Street View before Google. Really? Yeah. I forget what they call it. It's uh, a, a Z something. Oh, wow. <clears throat> um, anyway, so let me, let me take a swing at drafting a poll and then put, and, and Pete, like you said, you know, uh, float it through a couple of our planning calls and uh, see what people say to improve it or, or change it or whatever. That sounds good. Cool. Um, go ahead, Stacey. Pete, Pete, is there a time in particular that you'd be free for that call? Because I want to try to schedule it. Um, which, for which, which of the calls do you mean now, Stacey? <laughs> with the one with Sam. Yeah. If it could be either after work or a weekend. Um, I, I'm reasonably flexible. Give me, give me an idea <laughs> of what you prefer. Uh, uh, weekends, well, actually I don't, I don't have a preference. Okay. They're all equally uh, inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> well, put it this way. If it's, if it's a weekend, is it better early or later or middle? Um, uh, probably, probably like mid morning, but it doesn't matter too much. Okay. okay. Mid morning or mid afternoon. doesn't matter. My Sundays from 10 to noon are out. Otherwise my weekends are pretty open. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll do an email. For... Cool, and then I will loop us together to talk, to set up a call with Mila. Yes, yes, please. Groovy. Great seeing you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye for now. <laughs>